Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, where we left off last time, we were talking about uh, interacting bosons from a more microscopic standpoint. Um, I'm going to review a couple of things we did at the end of the last lecture, and we'll continue on from there. Just to remind you where we were, um, we wrote down a Hamiltonian for our interacting bosons. We can write in first quantized notation. It was sum over particles. Uh, this is a single particle kinetic energy, then there's a single particle uh, potential energy as well, and then there might be an interaction term. Um, I guess the interaction term we were using was u over 2 sum over uh, ij. We used a delta function interaction or i minus rj, but in general you could use a um, more complicated interaction. We rewrote, rewrote that in uh, second quantized form as integral dr, and then we have Psi dagger hat operator, the kinetic energy operator, um, 2m plus v of r. Uh, I guess this is a function of r also. Um, and psi hat of r, function of r, and then plus u over 2. Um, then it will be psi dagger hat of r, psi dagger hat of r, and then psi of r. I'll just move myself out of the way. Um, psi of r hat psi of r hat, like this. Um, and uh, so these are the Hamiltonians we're working with. We, we chose a delta function interaction because it's reasonable and, it's, and it's, um, it's easy as well. And we started by choosing a trial state, which was a coherent state. Um, we wrote uh, alpha phi. We're going to multiply occupy the, the phi orbital, which is just e to the a dagger phi uh, on um, on the vacuum state, and the advantage of working with uh, such a coherent state trial state is it turns the um, psi operator into a complex number, which we also called psi of r, which is alpha phi of r, or alpha is just square root of the number of number of particles in, in the system. Um, what we then calculated was the expectation of, of the Hamiltonian, which just with a simple integration by parts, um, well, basically it just converts all of the psi operators in this expression for the Hamiltonian into psi scalars, and then we do one integration by parts to rewrite it. Uh, uh, the del squared is a del phi squared instead, plus v of r. Uh, psi squared plus u over 2 psi to the fourth. And then we minimize or extremize the energy of the system with respect to uh, psi to get the uh, gross pidievsky equation, uh, GP or Ginzburg-Landau equation or nonlinear Schrodinger equation, uh, equation which is uh, minus h bar squared del squared over 2m plus v of r um, plus u uh, psi squared applied to psi of r equals zero. Um, as we mentioned before, this is uh, just a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. It's uh, the leading term over here. It just looks like the regular Schrodinger equation with the eigenvalue absorbed in uh, the v of r. And then this term is the interaction between particles. Um, Okay, so in the disadvantage of using the advantage of using the coherent state is that it turns um, it turns uh, operators into into scalars, and that's very convenient. The disadvantage is that now we're working with an indefinite uh, number of particles, and, and we asked at the end of the last lecture if we could have done things uh, in an easier way, and, and indeed we could have done things in an easier way. We could have also. Um, also, we would get the same result if we write a trial state, um, and we can do the, everything now in first quantized notation. In a trial state, uh, psi, this is a product, i equals 1 to n of phi of ri. Calculate the energy of the expectation of the energy of the Hamiltonian. We get exactly the same, uh, we get exactly the same uh, Hamiltonian where we define, uh, again, the uh, psi to be 
uh, square root of n times uh, phi here. So we'll get the same, same expression for the expectation of the Hamiltonian, and or at least in the large n limit, we get the same expression for the, um, for the Hamiltonian. We can differentiate the Hamiltonian with respect to the field, again, and get the lambda shorn equation. Um, so either approach, um, either way, um, so either way, we are getting the best um, possible uh, single orbital, uh, single orbital, which we call phi here, to multiply occupy. So solving the nonlinear shorting equation or the gross Pedievsky equation gives us an expression for the um, best possible single orbital wave function that we can uh, multiply occupy for this um, interacting uh, Bose gas. Um, now, uh, a natural question uh, that I raised at the end of the last lecture is that if we could do everything in first quantized notation here and get exactly the same result as we did when we had a coherent state up here, why did we go through all the effort of um, working with coherent states where we have um, you know, indefinite number of particles in the system um, and so forth? And we have to worry about second quantization. And the reason for this is because uh, very generically, even when um, this simple coherent state form or this simple product state form are not particularly accurate representations of the ground state, we can still choose uh, psi hat of r expectation to be the order parameter to represent uh, the um, the wave function of the superfluid, a quantity that goes to zero at uh, at the critical temperature and represents the wave function below the below the critical temperature. And the reason why um, these wave functions, these trial state wave functions that we've used are not accurate is because the, uh, the interaction between particles inevitably is going to kick some of the particles out of the, uh, at the lowest, out of the single um, eigenstate. So you try to multiply occupy the same eigenstate many, many times, but the interaction between particles then kicks some of the particles out of that, of that orbital. And so we already know that the, the wave function we're using is not uh, going to be accurate. Now this, um, this is where we start today's lecture, uh, the idea of using the expectation of an annihilation operator as the order parameter or the wave function of, of the condensate. And we'll do some examples of this as we go on. Now, most people in the field um, agree that the use of um, the expectation of annihilation operator as an order parameter is very effective for describing superfluids. Um, there are some people who feel like this is not really a physical thing to do, and one should avoid using uh, this object as an order parameter. And one person who is very vocal about this opinion is uh, Tony Leggett, Nobel laureate. He, is, um, he won his Nobel Prize for work on uh, superfluids, actually for superfluid helium-3. Helium-3 is a fermion, but the helium-3 particles, they pair up to form a, a boson very much like superconductivity and becomes a superfluid at, at, at extremely low temperatures. Uh, I think we'll discuss that a little bit more um, later in the, in the lecture course. So he's a real expert on superfluids, and he really feels that describing uh, your superfluid in terms of this uh, expectation of the annihilation operator is, is just um, is, is wrong. It's deceptive. And why is it that this is wrong? Um, the reason he feels this is wrong is that uh, you can certainly have a physical system with a fixed number of particles. Um, if you have a system with a fixed number of particles, the expectation of the annihilation operator is, is strictly zero. Because you know, if you take a wave function on the right-hand side over here, you apply the annihilation operator, it changes the number of particles. Then uh, if it has a fixed number n over on the right-hand side, it will have n minus 1 on the, on the left-hand side, and the, and the expectation of this will, will then, then be 0. Now, the, the way we get around this is we say, well, we're going to work with some sort of coherent state, which is a mixture of different numbers 
of particles, but he said, well, you don't have to. You still have superfluidity in uh, systems with a fixed number of particles, so you're obviously missing some of the physics if you, uh, if you try to use uh, an order parameter that's not conserving uh, numbers of particles. Fortunately, there is uh, a way around this problem, um, which is to think in a little bit more complicated ways. So I'm going to go through that because I think it's actually fairly enlightening to uh, try to understand how you describe this order parameter of the of the condensate, even if you're if you're forced to have a fixed number of particles in in your system. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to define the so-called one-body density matrix. Density matrix. I should probably tell you a little bit about Tony Leggett. Tony Leggett is um, uh, rather brilliant. Um, a physicist. He was an undergraduate at Oxford, um, and he studied when he was at, at Oxford as an undergraduate. He studied classics, um, but then at the end of his his classics uh, degree, he uh, convinced a tutor to take him on as a physics student as as well. He did the physics degree in I think did the physics degree in two years rather than three years. He said he struggled uh, with with doing it, but then went on to graduate school where uh, he was essentially orphaned. Um, by his, his supervisor who didn't pay much attention to him, but uh, he, he did quite well anyway by finding his own path studying, studying superfluids. There's a great story in his, his Nobel autobiography about how when, when he was a, um, uh, he was a, a starting student at, at, at Oxford, like everyone else, he, he went out for, for rowing. And uh, you know, so he, he joined a boat and uh, he thought he was doing um, really well in, in, the, in this boat, and then they discovered that he was actually a lot lighter than the coxswain, so they switched him, and he became the coxswain, and he thought that was a lot less interesting than actually rowing. And um, uh, anyway, so this is sort of the this, this story of, of, uh, of, of physicists. And anyway, so he spent his time doing physics instead, of, studying physics instead of, uh, instead of rowing, which maybe wasn't a bad thing for him. Anyway, so we'll start with the one-body density matrix. This is the, the technique which is... Uh, espoused by, by Leggett in, in particular. So it's, it's a function of two, two positions, R and R prime, and we're going to define it as the expectation of psi dagger of R prime, psi of R. Um, so it removes a uh, particle from position R and it puts it back in position R, R prime. Um, so this operator can have a non-zero expectation value. Um, draw that a little bit better. Um, so it's a not can have a non-zero expect. Okay, that's not a whole lot better. Let me try it one more time. So I can draw this a psi. Can I draw a psi? Okay, that's a nice looking psi. Um, so this operator has a non-zero uh, expectation value even in a system with a fixed number of particles. It removes a particle, but then it puts it back again. Um, but locally. It doesn't conserve number. If R and R prime are very far apart from each other, it can remove a particle from position R, and then very, very far away, it can put a particle back in to position uh, R prime. We can write this operator um, in first quantized notation, and very often, you know, we as theorists, we like to work in second quantized notation because it's very, very convenient for doing a lot of cal complicated calculations. But often, you can see the physics more readily in first quantized notation, and uh, I'm not sure if this is enlightening or not enlightening, but let me uh, give the, uh, the, um, the expression for um, the density matrix in first quantized notation. So it's an integral uh, dr2 through drn, n particles in the system, of psi star, the many body wave function. Um, where R, the first coordinate is put at position R prime, and then R2 through Rn, and then psi, many body particle wave function psi, and here the first coordinate is put at position R, and then these are all at R2 through Rn. Okay, so this is what the uh, one body density matrix is in terms of many body wave functions that you keep R2 through Rn fixed and you integrate over their positions. And you put uh, psi at position r and psi a star at position r prime for the first particle. Okay, we can even do this at finite temperature if we like. 
uh, finite t. Uh, we would write uh, 1 over the partition function of the system, uh, sum over all the eigenstates of the system, e to the minus beta energy of the eigenstate, and the same integral dr2 through drn. Uh, and then we'll have capital psi star of the nth eigenstate, r prime r2 through rn, and psi uh, r, and then r2 through rn. Okay? Um, so, um, good. So this is the expression for um, the one-body density matrix. And one thing to notice is that uh, row 1, if I fix um, both coordinates at the same position r, this is just regular density, regular density. Um, uh, see if I can draw, write that a little bit nicer. Regular usual density. Rho of r. Okay, so if I put r and r prime at the same position, this will be psi dagger psi at both at the same position, or integral over all the, um, I mean the, the psi squared here, um, will be uh, psi squared, which is the the phase space density, and then you integrate over r two through r n, and you just look measuring the density of the uh, of the first coordinate. Okay, um, good. So. It's sometimes useful to think about, um, uh, well, let me write again, r, r1 of r comma r prime. It's sometimes useful to think of, think of uh, r and r prime as discrete variables. Discrete, discrete variables. In other words, they live on a lattice. Um, and the lattice might even be um, extremely, you know, very, very small spacing or something like that, and you can take a limit of what the spacing gets uh, extremely small, but, oops, R prime and R. Um, so uh, it's just, it just makes it a lot easier to think about discrete coordinates than it is to think about a continuum of co coordinates. If you do that, then uh, this, this object here, um, rho of R, R, rho 1 of R prime comma R, is then a matrix then this thing equals a matrix. In fact, it's a Hermitian matrix. Um, it's a matrix. It's a function of two indices. This is the first discrete index. This is the second discrete index. And um, row 1 of, um, of uh, r comma r is diagonal. Equals the diagonal of the matrix. And when r is um, not equal to r prime, that's off diagonal. So uh, row 1 of r comma r prime uh, r. I'm, I'm, I'm terrible here because I, I draw r's in two ways. I sometimes do this as r and, and sometimes I do this as r. And I really apologize about that. It's, it's, I'm not sure why this is habit, but, it, but this is how I do it. Um, Anyway, so this is r and r prime. Um, so for this, when um, r is not equal to r prime, uh, this is off diagonal. Okay. So if we have a uh, Hermitian matrix um, uh, in any number of dimensions, it's diagonalizable. So we have a diagonalizable Hermitian matrix, and let's write out its, um, its, its eigenvalues. So let's call its eigenvalues. Uh, um, let's call it n sub alpha, and let's order it that n0 is the largest eigenvalues, greater than n1, greater than n2, and so forth. And the eigenvectors, vex, uh, we'll call them phi alpha. And they'll be normalized the way eigenvectors are usually organized. Uh, normalized that, well, um, in a, uh, in, in, when the discrete coordinates, it would be uh, sum over i, phi alpha, um, okay, so this is maybe sum over r, sum over positions r, I should write it this way, sum over positions r, phi alpha of r squared equals 1, 
But if we go to a continuum, and we eventually want to go to a continuum, it would just be the integral um, equals 1. Okay? Um, so we can then write um, in terms of, you can write your Hermitian matrix in terms of its eigenvalues and eigenvectors in the, in the usual way. So we'll write what, uh, row 1 of R, uh, comma R prime is it then going to be the sum over alpha n alpha phi alpha star of R phi alpha of R. So this is just the usual uh, eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition of a, uh, sorry, this one's R prime, of a, uh, of a Hermitian matrix. Okay. Um, now, in terms of this uh, one-body density matrix, the def definition of superfluidity is that um, N0, the largest eigenvalue, is order order uh, n, the total number of particles in the entire system, and then phi naught is the wave function of the condensate. Of condensate. With the usual translation that we write the order parameter psi as square root of n naught times phi naught. Okay? Um, so this is the, the new definition of the, of the order parameter. This is all, these are all a function of position. Like this, okay, now I'm, I'm doing that thing with different, writing the R's in different ways. Okay, that. Um, so this is, the, you, this is the, the definition of the order parameter. We, we can, and we can use this um, even for non-interacting, um, sorry, even for interacting bosons, no matter how complicated the wave function is, we can always define the one-body density matrix. We can, the one-body density matrix is always uh, a Hermitian matrix. We can always diagonalize the Hermitian matrix, and we can write its, um, the largest eigenvalue, if the largest eigenvalue is order the number of particles in the system, the corresponding eigenvector is then the wave function uh, of the condensate up to this, this normalization. So we can do an example of this, a really simple example of this uh, example, is if we go back to the non-interacting BEC, now you know, we're throwing out the interesting stuff, we're getting rid of interactions again. Let's do a non-int BEC at t equals zero. Um, so our wave function, uh, our many-body wave function, is then uh, e to the alpha a dagger um, phi zero. So I'm multiply occupying the same uh, the same same orbital, and then well, okay, we'll go back to the original definition. Um, row one of R comma R prime is then uh, psi dagger uh, R psi R prime, and in in the usual way, sorry, these are these are operators. Dun, dun, dun. These are operators. These second quantized operators here. Um, in the usual way. Since we're using a coherent state, the second quantized operators just get turned into numbers. So we get psi star of R, psi of uh, R prime. And then we can write this as, as N naught, the total number of particles in the system, uh, phi naught star of R, phi naught of R, R prime. So this is maybe not surprising that... Um, uh, that we uh, that we recover the same uh, definition with the same result that psi our order parameter is square root of n naught times phi naught, and and that's what we how we define the order parameter previously for for non-interacting boson, uh, bosons, but um, and actually we, let's let's do a, a simple uh, a simple case. So the case is if we have a translationally invariant system. So uh, if we have a translationally invariant, translational invariant, or in other words, V of R equals a constant, um, then our wave function is just one over the square root of the volume of the system. The, the lowest uh, energy wave function for a BEC is just a constant wave function if you have periodic boundary conditions. So maybe translational invariant 
periodic VCs. Um, okay, so now we have a problem here. This V is the potential up here. This is the potential as a constant, and this V is the volume of the system. So sorry about that notation. Uh, in which case, a row one is of R comma R prime is gen then just N over V, and um, uh, which is the density, and this is independent of R and R prime. Okay, um, okay, that's maybe maybe a little bit uh, non exciting. More interesting is if we consider a BEC at finite temperature, at finite T. Okay, if we consider a BEC at finite temperature, then um, row one of R comma uh, R prime uh, will be well. Let's again write it in second quantized notation: uh, psi dagger of R psi of R prime, and it's convenient now to to write um, psi of R as an operator in terms of the plane wave states. So 1 over V, sum over K, AK, VI, K dot R, so that row 1 is, uh, it's row 1 of R comma R prime, is then uh, one over the volume of the system. This is volume also. Um, then it will be sum over k and k prime. Expectation of a k uh, dagger a k prime, and then e to the minus i k dot r plus i k prime dot r prime. Okay. Now a couple things to notice that um, that this. Expectation by translational invariance, it has to be proportional to delta k k prime. If you remove um, something with momentum k prime, you better put it back with the same uh, momentum um, in order to get something non-zero. So uh, the expectation in a translational invariant system, uh, the expectations can only be non-zero if, when you remove some momentum, you put the momentum the momentum back. So that means I can rewrite this as 1 over volume, just sum over k, uh, a dagger k, a k, e to the, I guess, minus i k dot r minus r prime. Um, and um, this expectation now, a dagger k, a dagger a at momentum k, is just for a non interacting Bose gas at finite temperature, this is just the Bose factor. Uh, N bows of energy of K minus the chemical potential. Okay. Um, now, so maybe let's write that out. One over volume, sum over K, N bows of epsilon K minus chemical potential. I guess there's some data sitting in there. Um, times e to the minus i K dot R minus R prime. Um, good. Now, um, for uh, case one, is if T is greater than the, than the critical temperature, then um, if T is greater than the chemical potential, then the Bose factor is, is completely smooth. Um, so NB is smooth uh, near K equals zero. Nothing special about the K equals zero state um, if, um, if you're above the critical temperature. And so we have uh, row one of R comma R prime is the Fourier transform. Transform. I guess what this tells us here is it's, it's, it's only a function of R minus R prime, actually. Right? If we look up here, the um, row of R minus, this, this whole, whole expression is rho of R comma R prime here, and it's just a function of R minus R prime. Uh, by translational invariance. Um, so this is going to be tra Fourier transform of some smooth function. Uh, write that again. Of smooth function of the Bose factor, which is a smooth, smooth function. So when you have a Fourier transform of a smooth function, this will be some smooth function decaying decaying for large uh, r minus r prime. Uh, 
got it. If you can read my writing, you're better than me. Sometimes I write things and I, I have no idea what it is I've written. Um, however, case two is what happens if we have, here's the expression again we, we're evaluating. Uh, let me try to make it smaller so you can see it, okay. Uh, here's the expression where we're evaluating here, the Bose factor, a, a beta that's inverse temperature, energy minus mu, um, and then the um, Fourier transform factor. So for T less than Tc, um, then we know that expectation of A dagger naught A naught is N naught of T, which is large, uh, macroscopically large. The number of bosons in the zero state um, is a, a macroscopic fraction. So in which case, uh, in this expression here, in the sum over, over K, the K equals zero state is special. It's macroscopically occupied, and all the other um, all the other modes are not macroscopically occupied. So what we have then is row one of R minus R prime is uh, N naught over V, the N naught being the number of particles in the in the the lowest energy state, um, plus some smooth decaying. Uh, decaying uh, function, which looks very similar to this smooth decaying function uh, that we, we calculated up here. It's the Fourier transform of the Bose factor, but without the um, the large piece at k equals at k equals zero. So um, what we have then is uh, let me just draw a picture, some pictures of this. So let's uh, um, draw some axes. Okay, so this axis is absolute r minus r prime, like that, and this axis is rho uh, one of r minus r prime. It's just a function of the distance between them by translation variance, and um, and this is is zero distance zero. Now remember that if r equals r prime, you are always just measuring the density of the system, so it always starts out at just um, rho 1 equals rho, the constant density of the system. At, at any temperature, this is always true. By definition, the, the one-body density matrix, when you take the two corners equal to each other, you just get the density. So as long as it's a fluid, you'll just get a uniform constant density, it's called rho bar, the constant density uh, at r minus r prime equal, equal zero. Now for T above Tc, this decays um, rather rapidly. This. So this is for T greater than Tc. Um, for T equals zero, you get uh, BEC at T equals zero. This is constant, independent of temperature. I maybe didn't draw that so well. Let's draw this a little bit more flat. Can I do that better? Yeah, here we go. Let's draw this a little flatter. Yeah, okay. Completely flat. So this is... Uh, uh, for t equals zero, non-interacting BEC and BEC at t equals zero. Um, and what we just calculated was that um, for a non-int BEC at t between zero and the critical temperature, we uh, saturate to, um, uh, okay, so if rho one is n over v, we saturate to n naught over v, which is a function of temperature. Um, it, uh, some, it, you get a smooth decaying part here, and then you saturate to the constant n naught uh, of T divided by volume. Draw that again. God, I'm terrible at drawing, aren't I? Okay, better. Um, good. So, um, we haven't showed this, but um, uh, it turns out that when you consider an interacting BEC, BEC, for any T less than, um, less than its critical temperature, um, it looks like this middle curve. Uh, looks like 
uh, the middle curve, um, middle, that it saturates to some finite uh, value, it saturates to some finite value, which um, which is the or, you know the order parameter, um, and it's finite superfluid density at um, or superfluid order even for r very far from from r r prime, and this can be true for an interacting BEC um, at, even at t equals zero, even at t equals zero. You it will still look like this middle curve because as we men mentioned before that um, some of the bosons are kicked out of the actual ground state wave function due to the interaction. So it's both temperature and interactions will kick some of the particles out of the um, of the lowest of, of, a, of a single single orbital but nonetheless there will remain some superfluid order even at very uh, long distance. So actually let me try to draw this better. This sort of looks like it's um, let's see if I can draw it flat better. Okay, like that. So it goes out, eventually becomes flat. Um, okay, so this type of order, uh, this order is called, you might call it superfluid order, but it's actually called, um, is called off diagonal long range order. Sometimes that's called O D O D L R O, uh, off diagonal long range order, and it's a um, it's the it's the way to to define uh, superfluid order in terms of the one particle density matrix. And remember, it's off diagonal because we're considering uh, row one at R not equal to R prime. Diagonal order would be some sort of order in the uh, diagonal part of this matrix, in other words, uh, in the regular density where R equals, um, where R equals R prime. Um, okay, now in, in uh, genuine superfluids like, like helium-4, the um, helium-4 is, is highly interacting, and helium-4, even if you went down to zero temperature, um, the amount of, uh, you know, the amplitude of the superfluid fraction is actually a very, very small fraction of the total density. So it's, it's only about one-tenth as high as the total density is, so that the, um, the off-diagonal uh, long-range order is, is, is less than uh, one-tenth of the, of the total density, whereas in non-interacting BEC, the off-diagonal order is exactly equal to the, to the total density. Okay. Now, um, the next thing we're going to do, if we have time, and I think maybe we should uh, try to have time to do this. Um, yeah, let's try to have time to do this, because I'm going to go through this fairly quickly uh, anyway, is I'm going to try to discuss uh, a microscopic picture of how particles get kicked out of the ground state um, in detail. So how is it that, that interactions kick some particles out of the ground state into... So you, you can hear, if you listen carefully in the background, you can hear my daughter screaming because she knows what's going to happen here. We're going to start doing Bogolubov transforms and that makes her very upset. Um, okay, hopefully she will stop screaming in, in a moment or so. No, she's still screaming. Um, maybe I should pause the, the video at this point. Okay, I'm going to pause the video at this point. I'm sorry about that interruption. She was very, very angry. Um, okay, I, I promised I would discuss in, in some detail how particles kick, get kicked out of um, of the ground state wave function, and um, due to due to interactions. Um, this calculation, a uh, calculation using uh, Bogolubov technique, is something that that uh, a number of people may have seen if you took. Uh, Sid Paramaswaran's course earlier this, this year. You have, have already seen this uh, calculation, but it's good to go through it again, first of all, for those people who haven't seen it, and also because it's important to what we're, we're studying now. So we're going to consider it exactly the same problem we've been considering so far, but we're going to consider a translational invariant system 
with, with no trap, so we'll set the potential equal to zero. It's convenient to then uh, switch to working with uh, k states. Um, so instead of writing psi dagger of r, I'll write um, uh, in terms of uh, sum over k modes, e to the minus i k dot r times a uh, dagger sub k. Um, our Hamiltonian is, uh, well, there's a single single particle part, psi dagger, um, and the um, kinetic energy term, like this, psi dagger psi, uh, plus uh, there's the u over 2, we're assuming the delta function interaction, psi dagger psi psi, like this, and then all we have to do is substitute in this uh, Fourier mode expression into, into our Hamiltonian to get uh, an expression for the Hamiltonian in terms of these A operators. So uh, doing that without uh, too much fanfare, uh, the first term is exactly what you'd expect. It's the kinetic term is uh, you count the number of bosons in mode K and each one in mode k gets an energy h bar squared k squared over, over 2m. And the interesting term is the um, is the interaction term, u over 2 times the volume. And then there'll be a sum over k1, k2, k3, k4, uh, a dagger k1, a dagger k2, a k3, a k4. And then there's a delta function, which guarantees that the total uh, the total momentum is conserved, the total wave vector is conserved, so uh, k1 plus k2 minus k3 minus k4 better equal zero. And it's so, we should think of that, I mean, here we, when we destroy a k4 or destroy a k3, we subtract momentum k3 and then we add a particle k2, add a particle k1, we, we're adding momentum k1 and k2, and the sum of all these terms has to be zero since we have a translationally invariant system and a translationally invariant uh, interaction as well. Okay, um, so um, the approach here is that we expect um, uh, a of zero, k equals zero, to be multiply occupied, to be multiply occupied. Um, um, but we have to note that a that the number of particles in um, in the zero mode that operator does not uh, commute with the interaction term. It's just easy to check that uh, a dagger a zero does not commute with uh, this term here, and that's a, a, just another way of saying that the um, uh, that this interaction term kicks particles out of the k equals zero state. Um, now the way we're going to handle this is we, we're still going to assume that the k equals zero mode is highly occupied. So we can, you know, as, as we've mentioned a number of times, it doesn't matter if you think of it as a coherent state or a fixed number state with a large number of particles in it. Let's assume it's a coherent state um, uh, just because it's simpler. And that allows us to take um, a zero as an operator and rewrite it as square root of the number of particles in the state. And similarly, a zero dagger can be written as square root of number of particles in the state as well. Um, this is the usual thing that uh, working with a coherent state, you turn um, uh, operators into, into numbers. The assumption here is that the number of particles in the state is, is large. Um, so the fluctuation, or the, the comparatively, the fluctuation in the numbers is, is a small number. Um, so we're going to assume that n0, the number of particles in the k equals 0 state, is, uh, is a large number. So it's going to be approximately n, but it's, it's a little bit less than n, because some of the particles have been kicked out of the, uh, of the, um, the k equals 0 state. So let's say n minus n naught, the total number of particles minus those in the uh, in the uh, zero momentum state is much less than n. And the, our justification for this is that we're considering weakly interacting 
boson. So this this whole approach is appropriately is appropriate for for weakly interacting bosons. Now the way one handles this um, this Hamiltonian uh, when we have weakly interacting bosons and we have a highly uh, multiply occupied a naught state is we want to uh, treat n naught here as a, a large parameter. And so the largest terms in this Hamiltonian are those with the largest number of factors of n naught. So in these sums, these sums, uh, some of these sums, sometimes k happens to be zero. And whenever k happens to be zero, then you pick up a factor of a square root of n naught, which is a large parameter. And the largest terms we have in this, um, in this Hamiltonian are then the terms where uh, n naught occurs the most number of times. So the leading term, uh, leading term uh, is a term where we get the most uh, factors of square root of n naught. So in fact, we get four factors of of uh, a naught or square root of n naught of uh, square root of of n naught, and that occurs when all four of these k's happen to be zero. Um, and the value of that, let's call that, so this will be uh, for uh, k1 equals k2 equals k3 equals k4, and that gives you a value h naught equals u over 2 times the volume times n naught squared. That's the leading term. Now, the first subleading term, you would, you might, next term, you might think, uh, we should look for terms which have only three factors of n naught instead of instead of four factors of n naught. But if you look back up at this uh, at the Hamiltonian here, um, if we tried to set three of these a's to zero, then the delta function here forces the first a, the fourth k. We fit, try to fit if we try to fix three of these k's to zero, the delta function then fixes the fourth one to be zero as well. So there's no such term. Uh, maybe I'll just re rewrite this way. There's no term, no term with exactly three, three factors of square root of n naught. Um, and so the next term is next term. We want to have uh, two factors of square root of n naught, and that can happen, again, going back to our Hamiltonian, uh, in several ways. Well, one, you might expect that, well, these two could both be uh, at k equals zero, but if that were, if, if you set k equals zero in this first term, in the kinetic term here, then this k is zero and it has a value of zero, so that one gets, gets thrown out. You don't have to worry about that. But you do have to worry about this term. If two out of these four a k's happen to be at um, k equals zero. So either k1 and k2 are zero, k1 and k3, k1 and k4, k2 and k3, k2 and k4, and so forth. Okay, so at all possibilities, there's six possibilities of assigning um, which two of these four a's um, come out to be zero. So let's write down uh, all those terms. So if we write down all those terms. We, uh, u, we get two factors of square root of n naught, so it brings out an n naught. We divide by two times the volume, and we get a sum over the remaining k, k not equal to zero, uh, and we'll have four a dagger k a k um, plus a dagger k a dagger minus k plus a minus k a k. So uh, how do we get all these terms? Let's back up to here. There's uh, four ways in which you can choose one of these two and one of these two to be um, to be zero and one of them to be non-zero. So we choose one a to be non-zero and one of these a. We choose one of these two to be non-zero and one of these two a's to be non-zero. There's two ways to choose this, two ways to choose this, and that gives us four possible terms. Where the remaining terms leave you, you, you leave one a uh, not at zero and, and one other a not at zero, and the and the uh, momentum conservation guarantees that these two k's are at the same value. Sorry about doing all the scrolling here. Um, then there's also the possibility that you choose um, these two k's to be zero and leave these two k's non-zero, or these two k's zero and leave these two k's 
non-zero, in which case for energy, uh, for momentum conservation, these k's have to be uh, minus each other, and the, or these two k's have to be minus each other. So the statement, so the, with the different ways that you can uh, conserve momentum is either you uh, take a particle, uh, you destroy a particle at k and you put it back in k, or you destroy a particle at k and destroy a particle at minus k, or you create a particle at, at k and you create a particle at minus k. All of these things uh, conserve momentum, and this is the, uh, uh, the total of the six uh, terms. Okay, so the, the two terms that we have in our Hamiltonian now, are this is the leading term, this is the subleading term. We also want to use to our advantage that we have that n0, the number of particles in the zero state, is the same as, well, that's uh, a dagger zero, a zero, and we can write that as the total number of particles, which is a fixed number, minus sum over k not equal to zero of a dagger k, a k. So we're going to, we're going to need that uh, plugged in here as well. Plugged in here is going to be less important because it will be higher order. Um, anyway, if we, if, we, if we do that, if we uh, replace the n zeros, particularly up here, replace the n zero with n minus a dagger k, a k, and we add it to this, the total Hamiltonian at the end of the day is then rewritten as h equals u uh, rho over 2 times n plus, and so just constant, plus k not equal to 0, and we have h bar squared k squared over 2m, just the kinetic term, which we haven't done anything with, plus u times rho times a dagger k a k plus u rho over 2 a dagger k a dagger minus k plus a minus k a k, okay? Um, where rho is uh, the total number divided by v. So this is the Hamiltonian that we now want to want to solve. Um, and um, just so you, you, you have the idea of what's going on here, so this, this term is just the kinetic term and it's uh, changed by an interaction. Um, so each, um, each particle, whether it's uh, at any k, has some additional energy due to the interaction. But then these two terms, the so-called anomalous terms, the ter terms that have either two creations or two annihilations, what they're actually doing is they're taking or, 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 or they're taking two particles out of the condensate to uh, here, you take two particles out of the condensate, you put one at k and one at minus k to conserve momentum, or this uh, term uh, destroys two particles and puts them into the condensate. So it looks like it's not conserving uh, particle number, and the reason it looks like it's not conserving particle number is because when we dump particles into the condensate, we sort of lose track of them. Okay, the the particle number you know, we have the part of the condensate is in a coherent state anyway. It has an indefinite particle number, so we can just dump particles you know into into the condensate you know two at a time, so that we uh, conserve momentum or take particles out of the condensate two at a time, so as to uh, conserve momentum. Now this Hamiltonian is um, quadratic in these uh, A operators, which means it's solvable. It's solvable by so-called Bogolubov transformation, uh, Bogolubov uh, transform, after Nikolai uh, Bogolubov, who was uh, somewhat more famous as a mathematician than as a physicist, but also a, a very good physicist. If you're, if you're familiar with stat mech, you uh, might remember the BBGKY hierarchy. He's one of the one of the Bs in in uh, BBGKY. Uh, I think he might be the first B. Uh, I'm not sure wh whether there's a convention as to which one is named first. Um, but one of, one of the Bs is born, I think, and the other one is Bogolubov, and I forget which order they're written in. Anyway, the the uh, trick of the transform is to define some new operators, uh, BK and B dagger minus K um, in terms of these old A operators via um, uh, a matrix cinch theta K uh, cinch uh, theta K cosh theta K times 
a k a dagger minus k. Now notice that uh, on the right hand side both of these terms uh, destroy uh, k units of, of momentum. Here you destroy uh, k explicitly and here you create um, minus k. So both of these terms have the same same momentum and both of these terms would have the same momentum as well. But the b's are a linear combination of the term that uh, creates um, a particle with minus k and the term that destroys a particle with, with plus k. Now it's easy to check um, that uh, BP, the, 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 these b's satisfy uh, canonical commutations, b dagger p, um, b dagger q equals zero, and bp b dagger q equals delta pq. Okay. Now Sid, when he teaches this, he he has a um, his favorite comment that he likes to to mention uh, very frequently is that it kind of looks like this transformation is is not unitary. This matrix here is 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 not a unitary matrix. Um, so how how do we get away with that? We're very used to making uh, basis transformations in, in quantum mechanics, and we like our basis transformations to be to be unitary. But this is not a not a unitary matrix. So so why is it it's okay? Well, the reason why it's okay is because um, we're making a transform on operators, not on the basis. Um, the basis is the transformation we're actually making on the basis in Fox space is actually. Uh, still unitary. The only thing that's required to have it be a um, unitary transformation is that our new... Our, oh, oh da, dear, let me undo that. I was trying to just erase this. Dun, dun, dun. Just trying to make this a better looking commutator. You should always have your commutators look good, right? Um, yeah, so in... Right, what was I saying? The, um, uh, the only thing that's required in order to have a unitary transformation of our um, basis in Fox space is that these operators still satisfy canonical commutation relations. And as long as that's true, then we have a perfectly good unitary transformation in, in Fox space, even though the operators transform into each other in a way that looks like it's non-unitary. Okay, then we can um, rewrite our Hamiltonian way up here, um, our Hamiltonian here in terms of the B operators uh, instead of the A operators. So I won't go, I won't belabor that too much, but if you do so, you find that if you, um, it's a good exercise to go through, um, that if you choose tanj of 2 theta k to be u rho over h bar squared k squared over 2m plus u rho, then the Hamiltonian comes out to be completely diagonal. And I'll write down what it is. The Hamiltonian then uh, simplifies to a constant, which we're not interested in, plus uh, sum of k not equal to zero of energy sub k, b dagger k, bk. We've completely diagonalized the, um, the Hamiltonian. These b operators are sometimes known as local u-bonds, and they are the elementary excitations of the system. The e, the energy of the Bogolubon excitations, um, are as follows. Again, this is a good exercise to work through if you've never done it before. Um, some amount of algebra, oops, minus u rho squared. And for small k, this is uh, square root of u rho over m, uh, absolute h bar k, uh, plus dot, 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 for small k. And it's, it's rather crucial here that um, it's rather crucial here that this is linear in, um, let me just draw the spectrum here. Um, so the spectrum looks kind of like this. It starts out linear at small k, and then eventually it turns up to be quadratic. Um, the linear at small k, this is the, so this is k, this is e sub k. Uh, linear at small k, this is the sound mode velocity, sound velocity. Velocity. In fact, you can uh, uh, calculate the vo velocity is just uh, square root of u rho over m. It's this coefficient 
this coefficient here. Um, and uh, that's important that it's a sound velocity that doesn't start quadratically, it starts linearly, in order that it satisfies the Landau criterion for superfluidity. So a weakly interacting Bose gas uh, will superflow because it has a sound mode velocity at small k, that uh, the, the spectrum is linear in energy um, with respect to uh, momentum, and that then guarantees that it is um, a, uh, um, this actually is superfluid. Now, um, what's, looking back at our Hamiltonian here again, in, in this language, um, the ground state of this Hamiltonian is clearly, so the ground state um, is the vacuum of Bogolu bonds. It's the, it's the state uh, which all the Bs annihilate it. Um, if you then take the ground state and add, so that B dagger K on the ground state will then have energy K on the ground state and so forth. Um, or maybe I should say energy K. Okay, if if the, sorry, this is, I mucked that up. Ignore that, ignore that, ignore that, ignore that. The Hamiltonian, uh, if the Hamiltonian on the ground state gives you E0 on the ground state, then the Hamiltonian on uh, B dagger K on the ground state then gives you E0 plus, um, plus EK uh, on the ground state. Okay, so E0 is the ground state energy and E sub K is the energy of the, of the Bogolu bonds and you can just, you can check that by, um, by the commutation of the, of the B operators. Um, now, the fact that the, the ground state is the vacuum of the A operators, remember that the, uh, the B operators are actually some linear combination of the A, A operators. So we can even show you what the linear combination is. Here it is. The B operators is some linear combination uh, of the A operators. And conversely, we can just invert this matrix. The A operators are some linear combination of the B operators. Again, I'm scrolling here and I probably shouldn't be because it makes it hard for you to follow. But um, sorry about that. Um, but if we have this uh, expression here, um, we know that the A operator, say um, uh, uh, AK, uh, uh, is going to be some linear combination of, of BK plus V uh, B dagger minus K. Um, and uh, unfortunately, AK, or fortunately or unfortunately, on the ground state uh, is then not equal to zero because some portion of the A operator has a B dagger, creates a Bogolu bond. Okay, so this means that um, this means that the ground state, the ground state, uh, is not a vacuum for the A operators, for A, um, for AK. The, and the tr interpretation of that is that uh, some K states are occupied, or K not equal to zero, I should say K not equal to zero states, K uh, not equal to zero states are occupied in the ground state. Um, which is exactly what I was uh, saying before, that due to these interactions, um, some of the bosons get kicked out of the, uh, of the k equals zero state. In terms of the Bogolu bonds, in the ground state of, of Bogolu bonds is the absence of all Bogolu bonds, but this ground state is some superposition of, of, uh, of k states being occupied along with the, the zero entry state. And one last thing to check is the um, the occupancy of the uh, this this worth worth doing or worth checking the occupants okay exercise um, it's a good exercise to try is to see how many um, bosons uh, are not in k equals zero 
in the ground state. And it's easy to, uh, well, with a little bit more calculation, um, you will discover that, I think I do it in the notes, and I think Sid does it also, that um, uh, it's proportional to u to the 3 halves power for small uh, for small uh, u. Uh, so the um, small u. So uh, as you increase the interaction u, you get more um, more particles kicked out of the ground state. Remember that um, n minus n naught n minus n naught is the sum k not equal to zero of a dagger k, a k counts the particles that are not in the k equals zero state. I should also point out that um, that this this object here um, was uh, at least for the case where the interaction is is a delta function. This object here was um, was part of what we called our um, off-diagonal long-range order. So the n0 uh, over v is, uh, is the off-diagonal od over o, and if you remember, we drew, drew this diagram before as a function of distance between r and r prime, um, the density over v, um, and this axis is rho 1 of r minus r prime, the um, single particle uh, density matrix on this axis, it always starts at, at, at zero, it starts at n over v, and then it drops down uh, over some distance scale to uh, n naught over v, which is the off-diagonal long-range order. In this case, it's just the number of bosons that remain in the k equals zero state. Um, although it's not generally uh, a, a valid definition of, of ODL or O. The general definition is um, well, the ODL array we, we defined before is uh, expectation of, of um, the eigenvalue of the expectation of, of psi dagger times psi. Okay, so that is a very, very quick uh, summary of the Bogolubov method for treating a uh, weakly interacting Bose gas. Uh, next week, or next week, uh, next lecture, whenever I do it, tomorrow, next day, this afternoon, I don't know, um, whenever my daughter... Uh, deems it appropriate to take her next nap. Um, the next lecture will be on Feynman's uh, method of studying um, superfluid helium, and then I will also um, do an example uh, of, of um, uh, exam problem, because uh, we've been told as lecturers that we don't do enough example problems like exams, so I'm going to work through one of the problems from last year's exam. Okay, uh, see you then.